Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we long for the day when we will see Jesus face to face. And this life will be through and an eternity in front of us of experiencing you firsthand face to face will be in front of us. Lord, we long for that day. We long for the day when we will be rid of all of the things that constrain us here. Long for the day when we will be able to worship you with the worship that you deserve most fully. Lord, I thank you that you've given us this opportunity to come before you. I thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, your truth is weighty. Your truth is great. Your truth is greater than any man is able to communicate. So I pray that you would communicate today. You would accomplish your purpose and your people through this passage, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be looking at a passage from the letter of James today, so if you have your Bible with you, would you turn to James chapter 1? We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18. Henry VIII was king of England from 1509 to 1547. And like any other king, he desperately wanted a son that would succeed him on the throne. He was married six times, and his first wife bore him a son, but that son died in infancy. Henry fathered other sons and daughters in the following years, and as he moved through his six marriages, one thing in his life remained constant. And that was that he saw it as his wife's role to bear him a son. Like everybody else in that day, Henry lacked a right understanding of the cause behind his children's gender. Modern genetics has helped us understand that the trait determining whether a baby is a boy or a girl is carried by the Y chromosome, which is found only in the male. Henry may have been looking outside of himself for the cause of his children's gender. What he didn't know was that the cause was coming from within himself. We can tend to think the same way about the cause for our sin. We can tend to think that somebody else is at fault or some other cause is at fault, whether it's a traffic delay or a long line in the store or even an uninformed supervisor. We're prone to point to those undesirable situations as the cause for our impatience and our rudeness, our willingness to lose self-control, our sin. Sometimes we can even go as far as pointing the finger at God After all, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. He ordered, he organized, he orchestrated this particular circumstance that has led me to sin. In effect, what we say is, I am being tempted by God. James is writing to help us understand the true origin of temptation. So let's read our passage and see what God has to say about thinking rightly in the face of temptation. Reading verses 13 through 18 in James 1. Let no one say when he's being tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. What James is telling us is that the Christian who is responding biblically to temptation counsels his heart with five essential truths, and we're going to look at those this morning. And the first of those essential truths is that God is separate from evil. God is separate from evil. We see that at the end of verse 13. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So let's talk about temptation. Temptation is a solicitation to sin. It's an invitation to take a deliberate step away from what is obedient and pleasing to God into a course that is disobedient to him. Notice that temptation is described in this verse in the very passive voice. Temptation is happening to its subject. But temptation has to have a point of appeal 
It has to have a basis on which to appeal to its subject. And in people, that basis is their flesh. The part of a believer that's opposed to the work of the Holy Spirit is performing in them. And temptation aims right at that target and seeks to have its way with them. James says that God can't be tempted by evil. Because he is righteous and holy, there is no part of God that has been corrupted by sin. There is nothing within him that's a suitable point of appeal for temptation. Evil simply has no opportunity with God. And the word James uses for evil is actually in the plural form. James is saying that God is separate from all evils. He's separate from every kind of evil. Not just some evil here or some evil there. God is separate from all evils. He's not a valid target for any kind of evil. We may have some ability to stand against some, perhaps even many kinds of sin, but each of us knows that there are areas of weakness in our lives in which sin remains very, very persuasive. But God is not like that. Because God has no fleshly nature, he's an invalid target to temptation of any kind, all kinds of evil. Temptation simply has no point of appeal at any point with God. Then James goes on to say that God himself does not tempt anybody. At a practical level, we would say, well, of course God does not tempt anybody because if he himself can't be tempted, then he's not tempted to tempt anybody. And so God doesn't tempt anybody, and that fact just follows logically from the fact that he himself isn't tempted by evil. But there's a much bigger reason why God doesn't tempt anybody, and it has to do with his disposition towards the Christian. That's what we want to look at today. And what we'll see is that when God is at work in the life of a believer, he is at work for their good. Listen to these verses from later in this same letter that James is writing. Chapter 4, verse 6, James writes, God gives a greater grace. God gives a greater grace. That is working for the good of the believer. Chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. The Lord will exalt you. That is working for the good of the believer. Chapter 5, verse 11. The Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. That's working for the good of a believer. He's full of compassion and he's merciful. These verses show us that God is always committed to act in a way that is good in the life of the believer. If God were to tempt someone with evil, he would be violating this great foundational truth that he's always at work for the good of the believer. He would be working in concert with evil, and he would be working for the harm of that person. He would be working for everything that he said he's opposed to. He would be deriving satisfaction and pleasure from leading someone into the very sin that arouses his righteous anger and wrath. Doing that would be contrary as commitment to work for the good of the believer. It would be contrary. God is committed to working for the good of the believer. So it's really good for us to see the distinction between sinful temptation and God-ordained trials. Because when we look at our lives, sometimes it's very difficult to discern the distinction between the two things. The distinction between the two things. On one hand, you have a temptation, and on the other hand, you have a trial. James opens his letter to his audience with discussion about a trial. So let's drop back to verse 2 and see what James says about trials. And we see a distinction between the temptation and the trial. James writes, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James says, Consider it joy when you face trials because the testing of your faith will produce endurance. It's going to produce endurance. The trial that James is referring to in verse 2 is one that is from God, and it has a very specific purpose. A trial is from God, it has a specific purpose. And that purpose is that the believer would grow in their endurance. And we see something in verse 3 that's very important. We see the evidence that God is behind the trials. The result of the endurance is that the the believer becomes increasingly perfect and complete, increasingly mature and complete. The whole idea here is that trials are prepared by God to sanctify the believer. 
Trials are from the Lord, and they're designed to sanctify the believer. What James is aiming at in verse 13 is something completely different from a trial that's designed by God to sanctify the believer. What he's aiming at here is temptation, temptation that leads to sin. So the believer who's feeling temptation to sin, God is very clear about himself. God says, I am separate from sin. I cannot be influenced from sin. and I do not influence others to sin. Instead, and this is our second truth that the believer counsels his heart with, the believer counsels his heart when he's faced with temptation with the truth that temptation originates within himself. And we see that in verse 14. And here's where James takes the focus away from God and he brings the focus onto the man himself and his vulnerabilities. It's right there for us in verse 14. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and he's enticed by his own lust. He's carried away by his own lust. The word lust here refers to a strong desire. But not just a strong desire for anything. It's a desire for things that are forbidden. Lust is a desire for things that are forbidden. So within every person is a strong desire for the things that are contrary to God's design for fulfillment, God's design for pleasure, and God's design for satisfaction. You notice the terms carried away and enticed here. These are hunting terms. They're very interesting terms. They both work in relation to an animal of prey. And the word picture here is, is very important and very helpful to us. The term carried away conveys the idea of a hunter who is luring his prey away from safety into a more dangerous place. The insect, the orchid mantis, does this. The orchid mantis is a large insect, and it takes on the appearance of a flower. And when it does that, it entices other insects to come near to it. So when another insect leaves its nest and comes near to what appears to be a flower, uh, he comes near to investigate it, and as he does, he becomes a lunch for the orchid mantis. That's what an external influence does to lust. An external influence lures lust. It's an invitation to lust. It induces lust to move a person from a place of safety to a place of danger. The term enticed also implies something that relates to hunting. It relates to a hidden trap. In fishing, it would be the hook that's covered by an attractive bait. The trap is putting on a mask. Something attractive is concealing something that is deadly. This again is what some external appeal does to lust. It presents lust with what appears to be a very pleasing proposition. But in the end, it's a deadly weapon. So this is what lust does. When some sinful appeal is presented to lust, lust responds to that appeal by carrying the person into the context of that appeal. That's what lust does. But James is also very clear about where this lust resides. And this is one of the more, most important things about this passage. He's very clear about where lust resides. Notice that James uses the definite article here in verse 14. He said, each man is carried away by his own lust. Lust is not this thing that floats around in space, affecting whomever it chooses. Lust resides within a person. It resides within that person. It resides within them, and it responds to an invitation or an appeal that is outside of them. So for the Christian who wants to have a right understanding of temptation, it is so important that they have a biblical understanding of how lust comes about in a person. One thing that we teach in Build and we teach in Wellspring, as you heard Denny mention in our announcements this morning, is that the man who is saved by Christ is saved, and he is in this earth, and presently here in this earth, in a mixed condition. He still lives within the body that he was born with, but he possesses the Holy Spirit that is within him. And his fleshly self and his spirit that is in him counter one another, and they're opposed to one another. I want to read Galatians 5, 16, 5, 17. Help us see clearly what is taking place with the flesh and the spirit that are within the person who's in the mixed condition. Galatians 5, 17 says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. These two things are both inside the believer at the same time. There are two entities within the believer in this life the Holy Spirit and the flesh, and they're in opposition to one another. 
The indwelling Holy Spirit gives a Christian the ability to walk in newness of life. The flesh appeals to the Christian for sin. So you have on one hand the Holy Spirit that is appealing to the Christian to walk in holiness of life, and on the other hand, you have the flesh that is appealing to the Christian to walk in sin. So James is saying the temptation that we're so prone to say is from God actually has its origin within us. It actually has its origin right within us. He's saying we need to be more suspect. We need to be more careful with ourselves. We need to recognize that in our mixed condition, we're capable of carrying ourselves away from close fellowship with the Lord. We're capable of doing the thing that's most harmful to us. We're capable of responding to an appeal to us that appeals so attractive, but it will drag us away. James doesn't say this, but there's a clear implication here. When he's thinking unbiblically about temptation, the Christian is allowing himself to be enticed and carried away by his own lust. He's actually allowing himself to do that. He's very clear throughout his letter that the Christian response to temptation should be anything but passive. It should be active. I have for you three different exhortations from James for the Christian to pursue holiness in their life. They all come in chapter 4. They're all active verbs, and you'll notice these. Chapter 4, verse 7, James says, Submit, therefore, yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In verse 8, he says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. These are active verbs. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. Chapter 4, verse 17. The one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. In all three of these things, you see the believer taking action. You see the believer working. You see the believer asserting himself towards what is holy and towards what is good. So at this point, we can see something and that James is showing us, throughout this passage, he's going to be showing us a list of prerequisites for sin. And the first one is here in verse 17. And that is that the things that occur in the heart and mind of the believer before they get to the point of actually committing the sin. So what is happening here is the believer is accepting something in their heart and their mind before they actually get to the point of committing sin. The first prerequisite of the, is that the believer allows the lust that is within them to draw them away from close fellowship with God by the alluring deceitfulness of sin. It's one of the first marks that someone is going to run after sin is that they allow themselves to be enticed and carried away. So this is the first prerequisite, and the believer checks that box. But James tells us that the battle isn't won if we're merely seeing ourselves as the origin of our lust. This is our third truth. The Christian responding biblically to temptation counsels his heart with something else. He counsels his heart what we see in verse 15, that lust only leads to a destructive end. Verses 15 and 16. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The word then tells us something very, very important here. It tells us when we think about sin that arises from temptation, we need to be thinking in terms of a sequence. A group of events that are all linked together. And each event has a causal effect on the next. Something in the current event is a starting point for the next event. James is going to help us see that here. And the sequence starts with a person carrying themselves away from close fellowship with God in in response to a deceptive, alluring influence. And what follows from there proceeds in the same way that birth follows conception. James says that lust gives birth to sin when lust is conceived or becomes pregnant. And James is using our understanding of the pregnancy process to help us see this. Lust takes hold within the person the same way that a fertilized egg attacks within the womb. The prospect of sin has progressed. The prospect of sin has progressed from its initial passing thought to an idea that has now taken hold in the mind of the person. The person has made the decision to pursue sin. So initially they allow themselves to be carried away and enticed by the appeal of temptation. And then what it does is the idea actually takes hold in their mind. And the person actually makes the decision to pursue sin. And that's the second prerequisite for sin. When the idea of the sin takes hold in the person's mind, 
there's a clear mental decision to engage in that specific sin. And when the Christian does this, he fulfills the second prerequisite for running after sin, and he checks that box. And in the same way that a fertilized egg grows and results in a baby's birth, lust that has taken hold within the person also leads to sin. And one of the most self-destructive things a believer can do once the idea of sin has taken hold in their mind is to ignore, to actually just ignore. They ignore the counsel of Scripture, clear passages from Scripture telling them that they're about to undertake is sinful. The Christian knows the counsel of Scripture and they choose to ignore it. They also ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8 tells us that the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world concerning sin and concerning righteousness and concerning judgment. The Holy Spirit is one of God's greatest gifts and greatest and most effective tools in the life of a believer. In order to get to the point of committing the sin, the believer has to ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit that what they're about to engage in is sinful. And this is the third prerequisite for the sin. Disobedience to the Lord through rejecting the counsel of Scripture, through rejecting the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and also from rejecting the counsel of godly brothers and sisters in Christ that the Lord has put in their life. And so in that way, the third prerequisite is put in front of the believer, and they check that box as well. So what James is telling us here is that sin is not an isolated action. It's not as if the Christian simply jumps straight into sin. It's actually pretty sobering when you consider all the things that a believer says yes to by the time they've actually entered into sin. They've said yes to inserting themselves into the context that will appeal to their lust. They've said yes to the initial appeal itself. They've said yes to the sinful idea taking root in their mind. They've said yes to nurturing that sinful idea against the counsel of Scripture and the Holy Spirit and godly friends in Christ. And they've said yes to actually committing the sin. So we step back for a minute here and we just ask ourselves, does God actually tempt anybody to sin? And the answer is, by no means, absolutely not. If anything, God gives the Christian every opportunity through this process to run from sin. And so if that isn't sobering enough, James tells us the general end of sin. James tells the Christian that when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And the idea behind the word accomplished is one of maturity and completeness. And referring to the end of this sequence of events, the actual committing of the sin that's in, that has been in view for some time. So he tells us that sin brings forth death. And the consequence of sin is separation from a holy God. This is talking about God's response to sin in general. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, you see that God's response to sin is to bring forth death into the world. It's his wise and just response to sin to separate the sinner from himself forever. This is no simple end of existence. It's more of a misery of the soul that begins in this life but continues in increasing measure for eternity. And that's sobering. And so in verse 16, James is exhorting his readers to set aside all self-deception regarding temptation. He says, do not be deceived, beloved brethren. It's self-deceiving for us to think that God has some part in evil. And it's self-deceiving for us to think that temptation originates anywhere other than ourselves. And it's self-deceiving for us to think that sin and lust will lead to anything other than death. But James brings God back into focus in telling us what God does do. And that's our fourth truth. This is a really sweet truth, and it's found in verse 17. James tells us that the Christian who's responding biblically to counsel to temptation counsels his heart that God is unchanging as the source of all good things. He says God is unchanging as the source of all good things. Verse 17 he says every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It's coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Two things are being described here and they're being described in very simple terms. First James refers to every good thing given and then he refers to every perfect gift. The good thing given relates to the act of giving the gift. And the perfect gift relates to the gift itself. And James says that both of these things are from above. And he uses the word every to describe both of these things. He says, every good thing given and every perfect gift. What this is telling us is that above 
the Father is the only place that anything good can come from. There is nothing good that comes from anybody other than God. The fallen world around us manufactures many things which appear to be good. And we all know that. It appeals to all of us. They appear to be good. But what James has been telling us is that these things are deceitful, just like the bait that's concealing the hook is deceitful. But God and God alone is the source of things that are truly good. And then James uses astronomy to illustrate the vast difference, the vast chasm that's in place between the world's appeal and the genuineness of God's gifts. And we see that in his word picture here. He's telling us that God is the father of lights. He's the one and only creator. And he's the one who made the lights. And the lights he's referring to here are the stars and the sun that we see when we look up into the sky, either in day or at nighttime. We're all familiar with a sundial, aren't we? In ancient cultures, they would use sundials to measure time. And as the sun would appear to move across the sky, the shadow that is cast by the sundial would help them measure time by its movement. And so the shadow itself is what is moving as the sun is moving across the sky, or appears to be moving across the sky. But with the Father of lights, the creator of all of those lights, there is actually no movement, and there's no variation with him. So the shadow that is cast by the things that originate from the Father doesn't shift. The fruit of the things that come from God don't shift. Things from God that he has declared to be good don't turn out to be something of lesser worth or lesser value. They prove to be exactly as he has said they will be. And the foremost place we see that is in salvation. And that's what James brings into view with our last point. The Christian who is responding biblically to temptation counsels his heart that the result of God's saving work is freedom from sin's power. We see that in verse 18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits from among his creatures. God has many objectives in mind when he saves a sinner to himself. And we heard Matt help us explain and understand really well that, that what God has primarily in mind when he saves the sinner is his own glory. We see that in the, the passage that Matt read to us this morning. We also see it in Ephesians chapter 1, where we read that God's primary purpose for predestining us to adoption to himself is the praise of his glorious grace. We never want to lose sight of that. Never, ever want to lose sight of that fact. God's ultimate objective is his own glory. We see it again in chapter 2 in Ephesians. God saves so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So that's God's ultimate objective in saving the believer. But he has other objectives in mind as well. And we see it here as James brings clarity to what the good gifts and the perfect things are that he mentions in verse 17. In his sovereign will, in God's predetermined plan that he executes with full resolve, he is compelled to bring forth or produce new life in the sinner by the power of the gospel, the word of truth. He brings forth new life in the person. And God's merciful character compels him to regenerate a spiritually dead person into a new creation. And we see here the words so that are very important. Whenever you're reading your Bible and you see the words so that, it's really good to look at what comes before that and what comes after that. Here we see that God is bringing someone forth by the word of truth. And then we see after the so that the reason why he does that. This is very, very telling. It may help us understand why something happens. God mercifully saves so that his children can be first fruits, new evidence of his creation, new creations in Christ who joyfully bear the evidence of his saving work in their lives. That evidence is as easy to see as fruit is on a tree. When you look at a lemon tree, when the lemons are ripe, it's hard to miss the lemons. They're easy to see. And in the same way, the believer that has new life, his ability to walk in newness of life, allows him to be very easily spotted in this world. So the whole reason why a believer can respond biblically to temptation is that God brought them forth. God brought them forth. And in bringing them forth, he did something remarkable for them. This is the regeneration of the new man. We've been learning about this in Romans 1 through Romans 7, that there are remarkable benefits and grace truths that come to the believer when God actually brings them forth. And these are, these are very, very important that we must understand about the believer. When the salvation that was purchased by Jesus 
blood on the cross was actually applied to their life by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, the believer has the ability to walk in newness of life. And when they do that, they put God's work on display. So when a believer is, is faced with very practical temptation that is coming to him, he remembers that in his newness condition, in his new condition, he has the ability to put God's grace on display by walking in newness of life and responding biblically to that temptation. So what I want to do here is spend just a few minutes with practical suggestions for the believer in responding rightly when temptation appeals to us. Because every one of us have our own situations in life, and every one of us is going to be faced with temptation that is coming in one form or another this week. These are things that I've found to be helpful along the way, and it's been a rocky road for me just like it is for every other believer. But I want to share some truths that I think are principles that can help us when we are faced with temptation. Practical suggestion number one. Remind yourself of God's disposition towards the thing that tempts you. Whenever any temptation appears to us, it appears very attractive. Temptation takes the same form today that it took in the Garden of Eden when Eve and Adam were together. Temptation is, is very easy. It, it, it looks very, very appealing. But remind yourself of what God says about it. And Proverbs is a great place to start. When you're thinking about the harlot, remind yourself of what God says of the harlot in Proverbs 5, verses 4 through 6. When you're tempted to be dishonest, remind yourself of what God says in Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17. God says, a lying tongue is an abomination to the Lord. When you're tempted to lose self-control because of some circumstance that you believe gives you permission to lose self-control, remember what God says in Proverbs 25, 28. A person who lacks self-control is like a city whose walls are broken through. Your defenses are going to be destroyed when you begin to lose your self-control. There are other places where you can go and you can see God's heart for the individual to think rightly. One of the areas that's it's very difficult for a believer that can be very, very difficult is the use of their speech and using speech that's pleasing to the Lord. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to use speech that's pleasing to the Lord. Remember God's counsel in Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but renew your mind and live in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus. So the first practical suggestion is remind yourself of God's disposition towards the sin that looks so appealing. The second suggestion is to remind yourself of what Jesus did to purchase your salvation. This is very, very helpful. It's been helpful for me over the years. It grows in its utility to me um, to actually sit down and contemplate what Jesus did for everybody who would have him as their master. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Jesus actually took the sin of the believer into his own body. Everything that I have done that is displeasing to the Lord, everything that I've done that's disobedient to the Lord, actually became a part of Jesus' body in the year 30 AD when he was hanging on a cross. So he who knew no sin actually became sin. And it's good for me to contemplate that as this temptation is sitting out there in front of me. And then remember what he did when he actually, after he took that sin into his body, he actually became responsible for that sin. He became liable for that sin. And he actually absorbed God's wrath against me because that my sin was inside of his body. Read Isaiah 53, especially verses 4 through 8. Very, very helpful in understanding exactly what Jesus endured because of my choice to wander into sin. So secondly, remind yourself of what Jesus did to purchase your salvation. And be comforted by that. Be encouraged by that. Use that as, as a motivation to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Thirdly is, remember what Jesus did to purchase your sanctification. Memorize or at least become very familiar with Romans chapter 6. My favorite verses in Romans 6 are verses 4 through 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 tells us that we have the ability to walk in newness of life. We actually have the ability to walk differently than we used to live. Um, prior to my life in 1981, I remember exactly what my life was like. It was full of dishonesty. It was full of running after every pleasure that my mind wanted to do. Now I have the ability to walk in newness of life, to walk something that's different. Verse 5 says we're not united with Jesus in the likeness of his resurrection. And in the same way that Jesus raised from the dead, we actually have the ability to walk in newness of life. Verse 6 tells us that we're no longer slaves to sin, 
and sin is no longer master over us. So remember what Jesus did to purchase your sanctification. He actually raised himself from the dead collaboratively with the other members of the triune Godhead and gave us the ability to walk in newness of life even when the temptation is looking at us straight in the face. Fourthly, I think it's good to be discerning about what you expose yourself to. Remember that your heart is expert at deceiving you. Your heart is expert at deceiving you. We see that most clearly in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful above all else, and it's desperately sick. The heart is actually deceitful. Our own hearts are the thing that are most capable of deceiving us. Not everything else around us, but our own hearts. Remember as well that in this life, we will always have our flesh within us. Galatians 5, 17. The flesh and the spirit are in opposition to one another so that we don't always do the things that we wish. It's very helpful. And the reason why that's helpful is because we need to be wise about the things that we expose ourselves to. Because when we expose ourselves to the things that are tempting, it is our flesh that rises up within us. So to believe that the flesh is not within us is not helpful in our pursuit of sanctification. Another thing that's very helpful to remember as we're being discerning about what we expose ourselves to is how wise it is to actually flee the immorality itself rather than attempting to defeat it head on. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee immorality. Don't engage with it, don't consider it, don't toy it with it, flee it. That's very, very helpful. And lastly, when you consider what you are thinking about exposing yourself to, be willing to cut off the hand or gouge out the eye that leads you to sin. Do everything you can to remove the opportunity for sin in your life. Sometimes that's very costly, sometimes that's even very expensive. But that is one thing that Scripture encourages us to do. We see that from Jesus, our Master and Lord, in Matthew 5, verses 28 through 30. And lastly, what I want to encourage you to do as a very practical suggestion for pursuing holiness in the face of temptation is to position yourself well in the body of Christ. Remember that God's design for the body is that the body causes the growth of the body when the body is functioning properly. We see that in Ephesians 4.16. That when members of the body come together and they pray with one another and they listen to one another and they encourage one another and they understand one another's lives, that is God's design for how each one of us grows. And so if you're involved in a small group, continue to get yourself involved in that small group. Be productive in that small group. Be useful. Listen well when you're in the small group and you're visiting with people. And intentionally practice the one another's of Scripture. I mentioned some of them in passing there's praying for one another, there's encouraging one another, there's exhorting one another, there's helping one another, there's being patient with one another. Um, if you're running out of one another's to pursue, find yourself Eric Martin. He's your local friendly elder. He has a really good message that he teaches on the one another's of Scripture. So those are things that are very practical that help the believer when they're faced with temptation. What I want to do is just speak for a minute if there is no fight within you. And uh, if you look at your life and you examine your life and you notice that when you're, tempted, when you're tempted with something sinful, there's absolutely no fight within you. There's actually no striving against the sin within you. That's actually God's kindness to you to show you that you're in a situation where you don't want to be. This is God's kindness to show you that you need to be in a different situation. It's his kindness to show you that your own leadership over yourself is more destructive than you think it is. What I would encourage you to do is cry out to the Lord to give you the ability to recognize that your own leadership of your own life is more dangerous than you think it is. This is where the gospel is, is so valuable and it's so important and it's so true for everyone who believes. Everybody in this room who puts their trust in Christ and has trusted Jesus for their salvation, um, at one point leading up to their salvation, they were completely blind. They had no idea what was in front of them. And uh, you can look at anybody who's a believer here who trusts in Jesus Christ. And, and what they will tell you is that ultimately they had to come to the end of themselves and realize that God's leadership and God's authority over them was better than their own. So I want to encourage you with that. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for my friends here today. Thank you for the truth of this word. Lord, your word is true and it is good. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we consider your word, you would grant us wisdom in how it is that we should live our lives before you.
Lord, I pray for my friends here as they read their Bibles. I pray for myself as I read my Bible. That you would grow us in our affections for you and our love for you. You would grow us in our ability to think rightly when we are faced with temptation. Lord, that is what is most important in the heart and mind of the believer, is that you have given us the ability to walk in newness of life. So I pray for each one of us that you would attend to us in that. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.